I don't talk as fast as you would. We are living in a fast paced time. my body doesn't do what yours does. It's just my body doesn't do what yours does. I get Assumption, assumptions, made, about, me, that, <laughs> are, wrong, and, I, miss, out on that C O N N connection or maybe they miss out. More. It's frustrating because we are living in a time where it's fast paced and nobody slows down for anything so when they don't allow me to answer or I am too slow, I get assumptions made about me that are wrong and I miss out on that connection or maybe they miss out more. <sighs>
My name is Bruce Baker. My background is in linguistics, uh, in particular in uh, classical philology, Greek and Latin, and I'm president and CEO of Semantic Compaction Systems. Semantic Compaction Systems itself is like a studio. We have lots of people on lots of projects and there is an art to what we do. The contribution that Bruce has made in being at the forefront of the development of, of a system like MinSpeak, I, see, I think has been quite revolutionary in the field. You know, it really got us to think about communication for people who can't speak in a completely different way. There can be no doubt that there is something unique about MinSpeak. And what has made MinSpeak unique was Bruce's background as a linguist and understanding how natural languages work. I was born in Baltimore and we lived in the Maryland area until I was 13 when we moved to Indiana and I went to high school in Logansport, Indiana. I was president of my senior class, class of 1961. And I went then to Wabash College and then on to Indiana University where I spent time studying classical languages. Some years later, I decided that I really wanted to do more modern language work and I went to the Middlebury Language Center in Middlebury, Vermont, and I took a master's degree there in uh, French and uh, linguistics and was doing my first doctoral semester when I began developing the coding system we're talking about today. What I was doing was I was studying um, social prejudices and there are many social prejudices that have economic, ethnic, uh, racial bases. But what I wanted to do was look at the syntactic and semantic strategies used to express these prejudices in one language and compare the same prejudices being expressed in another language. I began with the typical ethnic, religious, racial prejudices, but they all had rich histories. I was teaching a uh, student to drive who had a, a mild version of cerebral palsy, and faculty and other people made uh, a series of supposedly humorous remarks about my activity, and I, uh, I, I was shocked, and I also thought, aha, here we have a social prejudice that doesn't have a political or economic history to it. And so I set out to study transcultural attitudes to people with visible physical disabilities. In that context, I met some people with cerebral palsy who couldn't talk and I became very interested in the communication aids and techniques that they used to get their ideas across. And I thought, no linguist thought this up. Ooh, it's My disability is cerebral palsy. 
technically, cerebral palsy is a birth defect. Since I came out of the womb, quickly, I was blue which meant I wasn't breathing. The doctors worked on me for 15 minutes to help me to breathe. The brain requires oxygen to function properly. Due to those 15 minutes, it determined the severity of my cerebral palsy. Therefore, I can't walk, I can't control my extremities as I wish, and I can't speak with my natural voice. When I was younger, my form of communication was a series of yes and no questions. People literally asked me 20 questions. No, it was more like 1000. I indicated yes either with a nod of my head or raising my eyebrows. For no, I just shook my head. This was painfully slow and physically exhausting. Like anyone, I went to school. First, I attended the Rehab Institute in Squirrel Hill, but back then, it was known as the Home for Crippled Children. My time there was spent on my physical strength. And yes, my walking. Back then, that was the ultimate goal, to get a person walking. This frustrated me because I realized that it was futile for me to attempt to walk. I wasn't ever going to walk. What was going to benefit me more was to communicate. I felt that it would free the girl who was always inside, waiting to emerge. One day, I managed to express that concentrating on walking wasn't most important to me. Instead, what was important to me was communicating. From that point on, that was what my speech and occupational therapist did, worked on my communication. My name is Chris Klein. I am 36 years old right now. What do most of my friends not know about me? I'm not sure if there is anything that they don't know. My friends really have an open communication and we share our life together. I believe that is what friendship is all about, sharing joys and sorrows, being open with what you are struggling with, and supporting each other. There were a lot of frustrating times. Not being able to communicate was only one of them. I grew up in a family that loved sports and my brothers taught me how to play. I did play t-ball and I did enjoy it, but I sat and watched a lot of games and thought I could do better if only my body worked. I know we are talking about communication and that was by far the most frustrating thing. Why is communication important to you? Why is communication important to all of us? Communication is the foundation of relationship building. 
Sure, you can build relationships other ways, but when there is a lack of communication, that relationship is going to die. Philippians 4.13 says, I have strength for all things in Christ who empowers me. And I believe that sums up my life. I do the things that I do because I rely upon the strength of Christ. God and I have had some good yelling matches at times. He showed me all I need to rely on was his strength. I know I wouldn't be anywhere if I didn't have the tools that help me communicate. You have to understand men's speech is communication. It is the tool that I use to communicate to people. Yes. I had. To spell everything out like I used to, I wouldn't give a full. Answer. Mm-hmm. With men speak, I can say anything I want to say and. It isn't slow or hard on me. If I had to spell everything out like I used to, I wouldn't give the full answer. With men speak, I can say anything I want to say and it isn't slow or hard on me. Many of the people working here have language backgrounds, and I know I myself taught foreign languages in high schools and universities. And after a while, I became somewhat discouraged. I grew tired of teaching languages I no longer really cared much about to people who really didn't want to learn them. And when you're confronted with an interesting person, there's this woman sitting there who's 40 years old and she has been struggling all of her life to talk and you're fine-tuning a system so she can talk. It is very compelling. I mean, it's quite a bit different from grading a bunch of Latin papers at night. Over the years, I've delivered quite a few seminars about the system that I developed it's a hieroglyphic system or was inspired by hieroglyphic systems and I called it min speak for minimum effort speech because the systems I, I, I had been seeing seem to have maximum effort uh, speech. I just modeled it off news speak in George Orwell's 1984 and uh, I had no idea that it was going to be commercialized at all or that it was going to be commercialized with that name. I think that is an amazing phenomena to observe as someone that's been in the field since devices first started coming out. A lot of people focus on what's the newest and latest technology. So it's technology first and sometimes completely ignoring the language software on the system. Semantic compaction or men speak system is not intuitive. You can't look at the display and understand immediately or make sense out of 
well, what do I push to say words? But as soon as the architecture is explained to you, it then makes sense. But you need that explanation and you need to have that open mind as someone is explaining that to you. What I began realizing was in, in, in my mind was that numbers and letters would require very long sequences. I space W E N T space T O space T H E space. Soon you're at 40, 50 letters in a relatively trivial sentence. And if you're doing that with a head stick, that is a lot of effort. And so there were techniques for uh, word completion. We'd start a word and then there would be candidates for completion. But that caused uh, problems of being looking at the word lists all the time. And after you've gone through several word lists, can you remember what sentence you were about ready to say? And there's some, some real data that says that you can't. I mean, it, it's, it's very disorienting. Spelling and word completion didn't seem to be working, and uh, I thought of hieroglyphics. I found that if you had a picture of an apple, and then you had uh, a picture of a skull and bones, it might mean, I'm choking. Uh, a picture of an apple and a picture of um, somebody grabbing for something or a wanted poster it might mean I want something to eat and I found that with just 50 pictures one could describe hundreds of things you might say not speaking It has been a long time since I have met somebody that was not scared of my disability. It is the first thing you notice about me. I have to say sometimes in the morning, I do not want to get out of bed. I do not want to face gravity again. Chris is different than most of the usual we get. And not everybody that trains can do it or handle it. You just, you know, you think you've got it rough and people have it rough, but 
you know, I say, gosh, I can't do things, and how am I going to do this? But I mean, he looks by himself. I just find it every day amazing. I would be too afraid to be by myself in his condition. So I don't know if it was strong upbringing. His family must have just really pushed him and, you know, made him be independent. They didn't baby him, obviously. In the beginning, we had to have his board in front of him nonstop because he had to constantly be telling me, you know, how to do things. And my finger fingers dig into my thumbs and without the Gloves. I have D U G dug my nail thumb down. To the bone. I have the type of cerebral palsy that my body and muscles move all the time, so my fingers dig into my thumbs, and without the gloves, I have dug my thumb down to the bone. So the gloves are just protection. <clears throat> It started when I was two. Mom put band-aids on them which worked but it wasn't great. I had thumb surgery when I was 11 that didn't work. We came up with this idea right before college. If you have a disability like cerebral palsy and you can talk, well, you can probably become a liar. But if you have a disability like cerebral palsy and you really can't talk, then suddenly, uh, your ability to maneuver around your disability takes on uh, dramatic proportions. Like anyone, after I earned my degree, I wanted to gain employment. It wasn't easy for me to achieve this goal. There were so many times when I heard, sorry, there are no positions available. I just had to persevere, and I did. Now, I have been the executive director of SHOUT for eight years. The acronym SHOUT stands for Sharing Helps Others Use Technology. When I come in, what I normally do is to make sure she's plugged up on a system, and then I plug her charger up, and she's good from there. She does what she needs to do on her own. I always had a strong desire to be a productive part of society. When I'm working for Pat and I work for the Deaf Blind Project, I check web addresses to see if they work or not. There have been times when a colleague of mine came in to ask me advice about a non-speaking child. I like those times. I like those times. <laughs> Hello, Jen. You look nice. Thank you. Thank you, too. Now, are you busy? Up. Up. Good. What the heck was
I was born with a disability, and when you are born with a disability, it's really hard to understand what you did to deserve it. I grew up 23 years asking God these questions. I know I thought for many years I must have done something. I know my parents thought that they must have did something. It is something you question every day for a long time. I was consumed by the problems that I had in my life. I had to work hard every day just to function, so how was I going to make a difference? I was more interested in questioning God and yelling at God. I wasn't interested in listening to God and hearing God teach me. My name's Matt Young, and I'm the pastor of discipleship here at Victory Point. And I've known Chris, man, 12 plus years. Just got invited to kind of join the crew that, that helps put him to bed on, on some nights. So that, that's how my first introduction to Chris. It's even hard to describe myself as a volunteer because I don't even see that role anymore. I mean, it started out in that role, like just helping put him to bed like every third Friday night. But uh, now it's just he's a friend. He, he's a guy that I, I you know, we, we talk about fantasy football, we talk about girls, we joke about them, we, we talk <laughs> about relationships, about movies. It was when I allowed the Holy Spirit to live for me that my faith grew. I started to see that God shine through my weakness. I decided I could be his servant. You know, I, I think what, what Chris brings to me and, you know, to Victory Point is, is just, you, you obviously see Jesus. I mean, you can tell Jesus is in Chris, and Chris lets Jesus live through him. You know, we're all broken in different ways, you know, sometimes externally, sometimes internally. Am I going to be able to go work on the mission field? I do not know. Maybe I am, and I know God will make a way for that to happen. The reality is God has work for us to do in our own neighborhood. He asks us to love our neighbor. Seen him naked. <laughs> oh, we taped it? Oh, hey, sorry about that. <laughs> God reminded me that there will come a day where I will no longer have to fight my body. I will no longer have to feel pain. That is an amazing thought to me. Jen was very, very frustrated and she was sad as a child. <laughs> And then she realized, she comes from a, a, a church-going family, then she realized that God could hear her. So after she made that realization, she had the conversations with God. And then I, I remember when she was a teenager and just going into a high school, uh, when um, she got a decent voice and we had a good system based on words, and oh, she was, she talked and she talked and she talked. And she speaks beautifully. Hi, actually. Remember. Talking. Inside. My head. I actually remember talking inside my head. To God. which is very connected and is rapidly delivered. It's a pleasure to have a conversation with Jen on our phone or in, in, in person. It's just like talking with anybody else. And I think that's 
<laughs> I think that was one of her big lifetime goals, and we're glad that we could uh, help her with that. I have a tremendous admiration for people like Bruce who can think outside of the box. It is what we need in helping people who have such severe disabilities as the people that we're working with. We need people who do things differently. I was showing my work to people and it was so different from what other people were doing and it was because I wasn't coming from this field of speech pathology or rehabilitation or occupational therapy or, or all the other fields that were interested in communication disabilities. And people looked at it and said, this is not like anything else. And I said, well, it's a system based on hieroglyphics and disambiguation through multiple meanings. And folks were um, saying, that's strange. But then when I showed them how it worked, they said, well, that's really kind of easy. Generally speaking, I just love my colleagues. That's not always the case, and it's not always a perpetual status. But um, I think people who work here like working here. My English name is Tian Xue Yao, but uh, in Chinese way will be Yao Tian Xue. I ask my American friends to call me Snow because Tian Xue is a little bit hard. I'm a project developer or manager in semantic compaction systems. Uh, I'm currently working on a Mandarin MeanSpeak project. On a communication board, if someone has a drawing or a picture of a cup of water, when the person points to it, he or she is not trying to get you to think of cup of water. He or she may be saying, I'm thirsty. So thirsty is what that particular graphic evokes and is called a secondary iconicity. If you tilt the cup a little bit as we do in our system and it looks like water is spilling out, it might be spill, it might have a lot of possible secondary iconicities. And getting an icon to have secondary iconicities in another language and another culture is a bit of an art. Mandarin Chinese uh, has a lot of specialties compared to uh, English language. We got a lot of help from many institutes, both in the United States, Singapore, and China. We got the first 1,000 most frequently used Chinese core vocabulary. Now we are trying to put all this stuff into a real machine. Sooner or later, one day, this device will be brought to China and the people will be benefited by that. Ethically, I'm bound to show everybody the lowest end device to the highest end device and all of the different ways that language can be represented and generated on their systems. You know I am trying to get more people educated and aware of augmentative communication. My goal in working with the children that I worked with was that I was building their language skills. So it never was just a means of providing functional communication or allowing them to interact with the curriculum. Like I can say my color words, I can say my numbers, I can identify the letters of the alphabet. But it was using language to say whatever they wanted to say and then being able to say it as fast as they could. The other serendipitous thing that happened with Bruce's idea is that Barry Romick saw it as unique. I sh showed this to a few manufacturers uh, in my first conversation with Barry Romick in a prescient sentence. He said, we've been engineering these devices to death, but nobody really talks with them. Maybe this is the answer. I'm Barry Romick, and I'm the co-founder of Prentke Romick Company and chairman of the board. Bruce was looking for companies to help with the commercialization of his idea. The very first work that we did with people with disabilities was working with people with uh, high-level spinal cord injury. 
and that frequently is male, uh, young male, uh, teens and early 20s, sporting accidents and automobile accidents. Uh, I had some ability to connect with those people because I was about the same age and realized that uh, by virtue of uh, some blessing that I had, uh, that I wasn't one of them. When I started to meet people who could not speak, I realized uh, the significance of that disability in terms of uh, uh, prevention of uh, the person to be able to be part of society. One of the things that has been powerful in my mission of uh, service to people with disabilities is actually spending time with them. And I've done this in terms of uh, helping people eat, uh, helping them with their personal care, really being close to the customer. Uh, I, every day, understand that, that my life has been blessed by what we do. And I think that uh, the rest in our company and the rest that share this mission have the same sense that uh, we're doing something that's above and beyond just making a living. I now have a deep association with the Prent Kiroma Company. They have licenses on my materials and some of my closest friends in life are associated with the Prent Kiroma Company. Communication disabilities themselves, uh, most people don't think about. There are a lot of reasons for being unable to talk, and it's estimated that there are between a million and a million and a half people in the U.S. alone who can't use speech or hand signs for various reasons. Somebody made a determination that they would get them this device with semantic compaction and men speak on it, and that device led to their ability to be spontaneous and generative and interactive. I would. Hey, when I met you, you were biking yourself and all that. <laughs> Cindy Halloran. I'm an occupational therapist by trade, but I work for Prinky Roman Company through the Center for AAC and Autism. I'm John Halloran. I'm a speech pathologist and I work for the Center for AAC and Autism. You know, I mean, the hardest part is that it's just getting them to believe that what they're seeing is going to be possible for a kid or an adult to do. They look through their own eyes at what it looks like. It looks too confusing for them. So there's no way a kid can make this work or a person with autism. But if they, uh, if they let them try it and, and, and let them play with it, and most of those kids and adults can make it work. You see someone signing, or you hear someone speaking Spanish, it can't be easy to look at that and say, well, that looks easy to teach. We, we try to break it down into steps, how am I gonna teach Spanish? And really, if you just expose the people to that Spanish language, made their environment rich with it, where people were using it, doing it, they would figure it out without having to be taught. So it's the mystery of how do you, how does anybody learn how to communicate? I do geometric shapes where you can overlap them and I put it into my feelings in the paintings. I usually listen to radio when I do it so you can say whatever I hear the songs that come out onto the paintings. This is my favorite piece of art a box ever done. And I do own it, but I haven't picked it up yet because it looks so good right there in this house. Well, we were showing a friend of ours about my place and we were drinking and I had an idea. I told John if he wants it, he has to buy it for exchange for a year of rent. And that's how it happens, you know. He is going to end up on orders is where he's going to end up. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of behaviors people associate with autism such as not getting eye contact, um, being stuck in their own world and not really socializing with other people that you actually see kind of disappear or become lessened when they're able to communicate. 
Bach has a really unique way of cutting right to the chase. And I had an older car and it was a convertible Mustang and I was driving with him in Little Rock here and I said, and I looked over at him and I was expecting him to be grateful for some reason for riding around in that car. And so I said, Bach, what do you think about this ride? And uh, he sat there for a minute and then he looked at me and he said to this talker, you have a nice family. And I said, thank you, Bach. And he said, he said, that's what I really want. So he cut right to the punch and said, that's what's really important. It isn't about this car or anything else. It's about these relationships in your family. Uh, it's always meant something to me that Bach's now got a girlfriend that he hopes to marry soon and uh, can achieve those things like you and I do. AAC can be frustrating. It is frustrating when the device does not work. It is frustrating when people do not always understand the voice. It is frustrating when people do not give you enough time to respond. These things are very frustrating. Yet, I believe the advantages outweigh the frustrations. Yes. I do. Me. You. Yeah. For. Dinner. Perfect. We have the check of a call anyway. Yeah. I'll see you then. Okay. Yeah. Bye. Uh, see you. See you later. Yeah. Goodbye. Uh, I'm Josh Romsa, and I'm from Grand Rapids, but I went to Hope College, that's where I met Chris. Uh, I played football at Hope, he came and spoke to our football team, and um, and when I heard Chris speak, I knew that his mind was was awesome, and yet I didn't really know how to approach him, because I didn't know how he interacted with people speaking through a machine, and um, I guess as I got to know him, I knew that he's just like just like us guys, <laughs> and uh, everybody deals with brokenness, and uh, I think that he's an inspiration to people in that way. And when people see his life, he actually lives that out. He lives like, don't let brokenness overcome you. We've known him. <laughs> you jerk. <laughs> the ball destroyed something. We're playing sink ball in the background. I love it. Crap. Yeah, he messes around with everybody. I like to sing because I feel like that is my calling. I like to sing because I feel like that is my calling. It's my great pleasure and privilege to introduce the Trinity House of Prayer Choir. I'm Elizabeth Lear McCarty, mother of Lucas McCarty. <clears throat> Lucas, I have a son. When we go out, people stare at him. Some look the other way but some come right up to him to give him a hug. He came into the world not pink and rosy, but gray and dead. 
Before the nurses and doctors could bring him back to life, his brain was injured. It was part of the brain that controls all his muscles. Muscles that help you swallow and talk. Muscles that help you move and walk. He can't swallow, so he drools. He can't move his tongue, so he can't talk. He can't balance, so he can't walk. But I don't want you to think he can't do much, because he can. He smiles a lot. He talks with the talker. He walks on his knees. He has friends all over. Truckers who talk to him on CB radio when they're passing through. <laughs> Church friends, school friends, <clears throat> camp friends, restaurant friends, and I hope you will be his friend too. <clears throat> to sing. I think he would love to be a singer. Um, when I first met him and he was, oh, oh, you know, singing at the top of his lungs, I thought, is he singing real words? And then, yes, he is. I mean, you know, he's singing every word. I think that is one um, big connection with his church, not only the total acceptance and love, but the, the music bond and the music experience. You know, that's, that's the way he worships. Uh, my name is Tara Pearson, uh, and I'm a writer. Well, the book is called Year of Our Lord, essentially because I spent a, a year with Lucas, traveling around the Delta with Lucas off and on, and going to church with Lucas. I met him by accident. Uh, I have a friend, Julie Chadwick, who is a speech-language pathologist. I knew that Julie specialized in assisted communication, but I can't say I truly knew much about, about it. I didn't know what it was, really. I'd never met any of her clients. Uh, but she told me that she made an appointment to see a former client down in the Delta and take him to church. And I've long been fascinated with the Delta, uh, and I was certainly overdue for a visit to church, so I said, I'll go with you. Uh, and that's where I met Lucas McCarty, who was 21 years old at the time. Lucas is, is the most determined individual I have ever met. His disability is never going to get in his way. He's going to do what he's going to do. And I can't tell you how many times I've seen Lucas just pitch out of his wheelchair and go walking on his knees, you know, through a homeware store or down the street in Indianola, and people just shout out his name there. Everybody knows him. Black, white, doesn't matter. Lucas crosses all class lines, all strata. He knows everybody. I have been going to my church for 14 year years I have been going to my church for 14 years Lucas is free to do anything in that church he wants to do because it's a very loud place. People can say anything they want to. They can shout when the preacher's talking. And he was welcomed immediately into the choir of the church. Even though Lucas, of course, can't speak, he can make a lot of noise. Uh, and he's very affected by gospel music. You can, you can see it when you watch him listen to music or sing music, that it just sort of takes over. It just kind of, it's, it's in tune with his spirit. Upon meeting Lucas, I did him the usual able-bodied disservice of silently wishing him normal. I couldn't yet see that he was already extraordinary. Every day that I schedule transportation to go to work, to the grocery store, or a shopping facility, I'm aware of how much my communication skills have enabled me to be independent. You see, my independence has meant the world to me. Although I, uh, I've never had any children and I am not a parent, I have come to appreciate the intensity 
of parental love. I have seen so many parents be heroically involved in the lives of their children with disabilities. I've seen people face really tough things and keep it together. He came to Jenny at a time in her life when I didn't have any idea what the future was going to be like, and he opened the door to a beautiful future. It's been amazing to me in seeing adults like Jen, whose mother was behind her, and young children that I'm working with, that parents brought them to me when they were two and a half or three years old or four, knowing that they wanted them to be in school in regular kindergarten <laughs> and be moving through school with their peers and they knew their child had potential. People still can't get the e y o n d that people still can't get beyond that it's getting better though it's getting better though it could disconcert someone when you first meet chris but the way chris overcomes this is because what he has to say is so normal and so typical and um, uh, Chris writes beautifully and um, he went on to get a master's degree in theology. There, there's lots, lots of theory. It, it's like, um, like a wheelchair. People think of a wheelchair as a fairly simple device, a chair with wheels, but it's not because if you're going to be sitting in a wheelchair for 12 hours a day, Man, it's got to support you in the correct way. And um, if you're going to be speaking on a communication aid all day long, you've got to have a very well-honed linguistic piece. Certainly users on systems that support semantic compaction are demonstrating a success beyond what's capable with the other technologies. They're the people that are talking. These children um, had the ability to learn language, but they didn't have a means to be able to express themselves. Well, I always feel that I've benefited more than I've helped people that I've worked with because they've been such an inspiration. Jen and I went to Singapore together. That's a 17-hour flight, and here that flight is taxing to me. I met the Princess of Thailand because I went to Singapore with Jen Lowe. It's not that Jen came to Singapore with me. Chris was speaking, uh, you know, and he began noticing differences with his uh, personal care attendants, with his family members. With Everybody he came into contact with changed, and it changed in a positive way. The one thing that's unique about children and adults with autism is when they communicate, I always call it a moment of joy. It's also a moment of pride. You're able to change that perception for people or give them a way to communicate. You see that spark in their eyes, very rewarding. Uh, appreciation. I appreciate the opportunity for me just to do this project for my people. I, I'm particularly grateful to Bob Conte, uh, who has worked for me and with me since 1983. He, he has an extraordinary focus on getting the job done here. But this was like a gift. Utterly compelling and endlessly interesting and I get to meet people who are using our stuff. Well you know what, first of all he is truly an exceptional individual. He's devoted his whole life to making my daughter's life better. It's helping people to get away of expressing themselves who are really locked up, you know, and, and given the opportunity to to be free and to be able to participate. Our, our own lives become broader. I'm going to say God enabled we don't have comfort. 
Tyler W I S E Highwood Tempest Insane. Otherwise, I would have been insane. You know. I get to see people making the best of life and being successful at it through enormous difficulties. There's a Latin phrase, ad astra per aspera, and it's to the stars through difficulties. And uh, I've met a lot of people doing that. I hope you see me, Chris, and whoever you do, just as people. Through Menspeak, Bruce Baker has given the gift of higher achievement for hundreds of thousands of people worldwide. I have the same dreams. I think for myself, I would hope they can see the person that I am after this. I am a child of God that is made in his image, just like all of us. Unfortunately, I have a disability, but that doesn't make me different from the rest of the world. I have the same dreams.